Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes, ¿cómo están? Eh, bueno, mi nombre es Elvira Yanganiose, soy directora del MACBA y en esta ocasión tengo el honor también de ser... ¿Todo bien por ahí atrás? Que veo que entra alguna gente. Hola, ¿qué tal? <risa> Como les decía, eh, en esta ocasión tengo además de ser el, el honor de ser una de las directoras de esta nueva edición del de programa de estudios independientes del MACBA, el PEI. ¿no? Eh, hace unos, unos días, no hace tanto tiempo, tuvimos aquí a más, Hindeger, más Jorge Hindeger Cruz y a, y a Elvira Espejo, acá hay, que tuvieron una conversación que supuso el final de tres días fantásticos en los que eh, tanto ella como um, los integrantes de, del PEI estuvieron tejiendo, narrando y contándose unos a otros, no solamente historias, sino contándose unos a otros a través del de tejido, ¿no? a través de lo que ella llama ¿no? la, la mutua crianza de las artes. Y me pareció que era una manera muy bella de empezar los formatos de Pay Suber y de mostrar una de las cosas que va a ser muy importante en el curso de lo que es este proyecto. Como sabéis, eh, hace unos, yo, yo creo que no hace ni siquiera un año, hace unos meses, eh, eh, se había, hace una, el, el, no, recientemente, Iniciamos nosotros este, esta nueva edición y la nombramos número 9, porque como sabéis, la mayoría de vosotros existió una edición número 8 que no tuvo lugar. Para nosotros desde la institución fue muy importante reivindicar el rol que tiene el programa de estudios independientes, que desde 2006 se ha formulado como una herramienta de aprendizaje mutuo y de crítica institucional, que fomenta la, sobre todo la generación de un pensamiento colectivo compartido de un saber a través de interrelación de muchos aspectos, desde las prácticas artísticas, desde la teoría, desde las ciencias sociales, la intervención política, etc. Y en ese momento en el que no fluctuó eh, ese, esa edición pasada, una de las cosas que fue más importante y una de mis primeras decisiones como directora fue decir que el PEI iba a continuar y que además tenía que continuar de una manera dista, distinta. Hicimos un análisis de lo que habían sido las ediciones previas y por eso quiero agradecer a numerosas compañeras de la institución, pero sobre todo a Ingrid Rubio, que me pudo ¿no? presentar un mapeado de lo que habían sido la, la relación de ediciones del PEI desde su fundación. Era pensada sobre todo como un ente autónomo que constituía un espacio conceptual y material para el desarrollo de prácticas discursivas y no discursivas, de emancipación, de renovación y de construcción conjunta. Inició seguramente su periodo como un ejercicio teórico muy puntual en el que la relación quizás con el presente era menos evidente de que lo que es ahora, pero si hemos hecho algo en esta edición del PEI es generar una transición desde la que establecemos Barcelona, colectivos de Barcelona, redes de conocimiento en la ciudad, como parte de los casos de estudio que nosotros queremos abordar desde aquí. No sé si me equivoco, eso me lo dirán después, porque ahora nadie se va, me va a interrumpir, pero creo que esta es la edición del PEI que más gente de diferentes procedencias, pero que vive desde hace tiempo en Barcelona, forma parte como participante, como integrante, como grupo. Estamos extremadamente orgullosas y muy honradas desde la dirección, pero también desde los diferentes profesores, lectores, gente que nos ayuda con las uh, eh, lecciones compartidas, que también diré sus nombres después, pero que han sido fundamentales para pensar el PEI de otra manera, para pensar el PEI como una herramienta de conocimiento compartido, como bien decía, pero que tiene en cuenta todas esas otras políticas que están surgiendo en la ciudad que tiene en cuenta todos esos saberes locales, ese trabajo transgeneracional y por eso mi énfasis en, en el momento fundacional de este, de este proyecto. Como decía, eh, la idea es siempre de ofrecerlo como una plataforma autosuficiente, pero me diréis, ¿y por qué entonces estás tú aquí? <risa> autosuficiente e independiente de la institución que mantenga ese gesto. ¿no? Y yo lo decía en la presentación del PEI, que para mí era muy importante este momento, que era como el último momento de disidencia antes de caer normalizada, ¿no? <risa> pero que era muy importante, y ahora ya en serio, pensar también desde la institución de qué manera podíamos generar plataformas que nos sobrepasaran, que nos mantuviesen siempre ¿no? eh, pendiente de lo que no éramos capaces de generar desde dentro de la institución, 
a veces porque no existía el tiempo, otras veces porque no existía la capacidad. Y tengo que decir que tengo un equipo extraordinario y que somos un grupo y una comunidad extraordinaria, pero que tenemos también muchas cosas que aprender y que los tiempos de los museos, los tiempos de las instituciones culturales y artísticas no siempre son todo lo veloces que la vida requeriría. Pues bien, como decía, hay una condición de posibilidad que se fragua en este proyecto, que se genera a través de una fórmula de vulnerabilidad y fortalecimiento de una agencia en suma de aquellos a quienes espera interpelar. ¿Vale? Este año, como bien decía, tengo la suerte de contar con dos personas con las que llevo mucho tiempo en conversación, Caderatia y Max Jorge Hindegger Cruz, que ya nombré antes, con los que hemos estado hablando mucho tiempo de qué significa construir instituciones. ¿no? Y me parecía lo más apropiado en ese momento de que necesitábamos centrar las perspectivas de qué puede hacer este museo por el futuro, de imaginar ese futuro con ellos y de empezar a conversar no solamente con ellos especialmente, sino con la gente que ellos traían desde diferentes plataformas de las que ahora en un ratito más les hablaré. ¿Qué nos interesa, como decía antes, ¿no? articular no solamente el conocimiento desde aquí, desde una plataforma que antecede, que anticipa otras necesidades a las que el museo debería atender, sino también generar un proyecto desarrollado en, en diálogo con las comunidades y los agentes y colectivos locales? ¿vale? Por eso nos articulamos como una suerte de políticas de apertura y estrategias de producción comprometidas con, por un lado, la creación colectiva, las ecologías eh, comunitarias, la crítica institucional, la descanonización del saber y la descolonización de estructuras que organizan y normativizan nuestros cuerpos y nuestras capacidades afectivas y cognitivas en un ejercicio consciente de construcción de un legado para el futuro del programa y de su modo de, de pensamiento más allá del mismo. Por lo tanto, como veis, es, no es solamente lo que estamos generando hoy aquí, sino qué, es, qué, de, qué de esto nos servirá para construir ese futuro al que nosotros hemos llamado oasis, ¿no? al que hemos generado como modelos de resistencia. ¿no? Eso me parece como una de las grandes eh, preguntas nuestras. ¿no? ¿Cuáles son esos espacios de resistencia ideológica y de generación de, de eh, conocimiento compartido que traemos hoy aquí? ¿no? En algunos casos la metodología eh, pasará por, por usar esos escenarios de especulación en los que la investigación artística y el activismo operarán como una suerte de proceso único en el que confluyen de manera interseccional diferentes formas de conocimientos y sistemas de representación y de, y de codificación social. Algunos de estos ya están en parte de las cosas que hablamos, la lucha antirracista, los estudios poscoloniales, pero otros están también por construirse, ¿no? siguiendo con, con eso los movimientos sociales para la reivindicación de una justicia social, el derecho a la ciudad. ¿no? Estos son parte de, lo, de algunos de los temas que hablamos en nuestras sesiones. Pero también observar cuál es la historia de las instituciones y sobre todo, que esta ya es mi fascinación personal, cuál es el gesto instituyente. No, eh, no hace mucho alguien me decía, uno tiene que asumir que la generación de una institución algo del gesto instituyente se pierde. Pues antes de que se pierda, ¿cuál es ese gesto? Esta es una de las cuestiones que, por ejemplo, eh, observamos muy directamente desde la, en la parte que yo, que yo presento, digamos, como eje transversal, que es la de los imaginarios institucionales. ¿no? Que se pregunta también, ¿no? ¿cuáles son las condiciones necesarias para la constitución de un imaginario institucional? ¿Y de qué mecanismos nos provee la historia para dar forma ¿no? a formas de colectividad o a nociones como diría mapa de teatro de juntanza, ¿no? que yo he llamado en otras ocasiones togetherness, por esto de estar en la academia eh, anglosajona, y que afloran de esos procesos. ¿no? Hay un claro deseo también ahí, en este gesto nuestro, y creo que también utilizar el PEI, la posibilidad de estar aquí en el PEI como una forma de repensar esa noción de museo, ¿no? que se reflexiona a través de casos de estudio y que de forma, de alguna manera, y que de alguna manera busca ¿no? en formas institucionales, para institucionales y de colectividad que han tenido lugar ¿no? y que se gestan dentro del imaginario occidental, pero también y muy especialmente fuera. Procesos de comunidad ancestral, manifestaciones rituales, sociopolíticas y otras fórmulas de gobernabilidad cultural, etc. 
De esto ya hablaremos en su momento porque nos queda, por ejemplo, también el trabajo que desarrollará y que lleva ya desarrollando un tiempo Max con el programa Cultura Política, ¿no? ese laboratorio de pensamiento que es el que nos trajo a Elvira hasta aquí y que él desarrolla junto a Claudia Pacheco Cruz, eh, perdón, Claudia Pacheco Arroz. Y eh, súper importante en esta, en, esta, en esta formulación de esa red de espacios que comentábamos antes, de esa red también que une un diálogo entre cultura y contracultura, si se quiere ver así, de la colonia nómada, que es una reactivación conceptual y material del proyecto Plataforma Coloní, que se inició y que se eh, creó en París por Cader y otros miembros de su familia y miembros de comunidades eh, intelectuales y activistas eh, de Francia y de otros lugares del mundo, entre 2016 y 2021. Pero quizás hoy estamos aquí, y ahora me he dado cuenta que no tengo noción del tiempo, así que alguien me tiene que decir cómo voy, eh, a, para hablar de dónde están los oasis, ¿no?, nosotros aquí hacemos una referencia a modos de hacer, a, a esos espacios, como decía, de resistencia. ¿no? Y sobre todo de, de imaginarnos, ¿no? esa pregunta por los oasis significa imaginarnos cuáles son, dónde y cómo queremos resistir. ¿no? Cuáles son esos elementos de emancipación que nos unen como comunidad, pero también que nos desarticulan. Cuáles son los tiempos de lo común y de qué manera deberíamos convivir como si la sociedad que deseamos ya existiera. Eh, no quiero enrollarme mucho más, solamente decir que esta novena edición también es un ejercicio de apreciación por ediciones y formatos anteriores, que entendemos que es una oportunidad de transformar, repensar y rearticular lo dado por hecho y de generar un proyecto en el que nuevas alianzas y afectos nos permitan vislumbrar ¿no? este primer oasis, este primer momento, en el que por, creo que por primera vez también estamos los tres directores, que vamos a estar tres días recordando uh, lo que estamos haciendo en cada una de nuestras sesiones y planteando ¿no? esta, esta, esta formalización de, del museo. En ese sentido, solamente avanzar, ¿no? que en los próximos días eh, hablaremos con... Eh, con Max Jorge de cómo descolonizar Europa, si es que se puede, que nos pregunta. <risa> y que desgraciadamente, por una cuestión personal, no tendremos con nosotros a Emily Yassir, que venía a hablarnos de, las, de, la, de lo translocal, ¿no? de las proximidades translocales. ¿no? Emily se disculpa porque ha tenido una cuestión personal que le impide estar aquí hoy, pero sí que me ha pedido que os diga que vendrá en otro momento y haremos otro eh, payover especial con ella. Mañana yo también os hablaré de, de, de la noción del hecho de estar juntos. Yo le llamaba togetherness porque no tenía otra, como os decía antes, un, otro calificativo. Pero eh, hablando el otro día con Mapa Teatro, creo que las juntanzas va a ser un, es, un espacio de exploración eh, muy bueno para mí. Eh, por lo tanto, como decía, mañana empezaremos a, a la hora que está programada. Aquí pone a las 5. Empezaremos a las 5. Y de hecho lo que haremos seguramente es que terminaremos antes. Eh, pero es importante que, que sepáis eso, que en otro momento tendremos a, a Emilia aquí y volveremos a abrir el foro para que podáis venir a escucharla y pasar tiempo con ella. El viernes, eh, para terminar, tendremos a Caderatia, que hablará de la, in, de la individuación colectiva y qué supone eso para nosotros. Y una cosa maravillosa que me parece que, que, que conecta también con parte de lo que... Eh, eh, Achille nos va a hablar hoy, que es eh, la, la presentación de, de Sara Nutal. Y Sara nos va a hablar de infraestructuras terrestres, ¿no? de la tierra, ¿no? the earth, como infraestructura, que me parece bellísimo. También ese mismo día, será un día muy especial, que tendremos también a, a um, François Vergés, hablándonos de la historia oral de un oasis ¿no? eh, de 2070. Una, una prefiguración, ¿no? de un ejercicio de ficción especulativa que nos lleva a, a, a preguntarnos por este momento presente. Esas son algunas de las claves, como decía, de lo que van a ser eh, estos días, pero hoy es hoy. Y es para mí un inmenso placer uh, traer aquí a esta casa. <ríe> Casi me siento un poco emocional. La verdad que hace muchos años que no nos veíamos, pero nos conocemos también desde hace mucho. A Chile, muchísimas gracias por venir. A Chile en Bembe nos va a hablar de nuestra comunidad terrestre, our earthly uh, Common Earth, ¿no? o Our Earthly Community. 
Y hablando también ¿no? de, este, de, 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 de esa tecnología, ¿no? del mundo en el, que, en el que nos enfrentamos y si seremos capaces de inventar diferentes modos de medir que abran la posibilidad, nos pregunta, de una estética diferente, de una política alternativa de habitar, de reparar y de compartir la tierra. Eh, os cuento simplemente que ahora va a, a Chile va a ser su presentación, luego vamos a tener un debate con, todo, con el resto de directores y con él, un pequeño diálogo, y a ese diálogo esperamos que os podáis incorporar también eh, vosotras. Pues nada, que disfrutéis muchísimo, muchísimas gracias por venir, muchísimas gracias a los que estáis en casa y os pido que demos una calurosa bienvenida a Chile en Bombe. First of all, uh, I would like to, to tell you how, how happy uh, I am um, uh, to, be, to be here. Uh, I used to come to Barcelona a lot uh, many years ago, but I'm particularly happy to come this time um, uh, at the invitation of, uh, of, of Elvira. <clears throat> uh, uh, needless to say, uh, uh, I like Elvira very much, and uh, I, I am very grateful that you, you have given her uh, a place here. Uh, she is a gift to you and, and to all of us. Uh, and uh, I very much hope that you, you will take good care of, of her uh, while she's here. Uh, I am very happy to... Um, uh, see all uh, the faces of old friends too. Um, should I be mentioning uh, Kader, who has been a, a, a true inspiration to to many of us, uh, and who, in his wickedness, uh, uh, has been able to to uh, uh, to to bring us to think uh, deeply about uh, some of the the uh, the major questions of of our times. I'm also very happy to see Max, whom I last saw in in, uh, in New York. Um, uh, he was then uh, in in La Paz, uh, in Ecuador. I didn't know that he he had to to leave for for some time, and, and I'm happy that he he found uh, hospitality uh, here too. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the entire team uh, at Magba. Uh, Miriam, uh, Ingrid, there are many of them, long list, for, for the hospitality and the conviviality and, uh, and the truly original work done here. Uh, both, uh, as Elvira was uh, saying, or delineating, in terms of, uh, of reinventing the museum uh, for these times of ours, uh, for which we don't have a proper name yet, but we still have to uh, keep looking for it. And uh, in terms of uh, decolonizing it, uh, which means uh, making, turning it into an oasis, uh, that is uh, uh, a space probably where the, uh, the universal right to breathe can be experimented with, uh, which I believe is, is by definition, an, an infinite task. Um, I came with all my family, um, including <laughs> uh, Leah and Anil, who are uh, uh, our daughter and, and, and son, and of course with, with Sarah, uh, whom you referred to, who is uh, sitting uh, if I see very well, uh, so, some, somewhere there. Uh, now, tonight, uh, what I would like to do is to offer 
a set of, of remarks. Um, remarks on uh, something I call the last utopia. Or should I say oasis? Of which I suggest the earth with capital E is the ultimate manifestation. So uh, already I put right there on the table the proposition that if we are looking for an oasis, we don't really need to, to, to look far away. It's already with us here. It's already in our midst. We are already part of it. It is the earth with capital E. Now, when I say the earth, I do not mean the world. I do not mean the globe or even the planet. Nor do I mean the cosmos, uh, to go a little bit higher, or, or, or the universe. To be sure, by invoking this term, the Earth, with a capital E, I am not making a commentary on humanity at the exclusion of the physical world. I'm referring, of course, to the, uh, the geological uh, magma-filled rock we know of. We, we're standing on a rock. But I also have in mind species such as plants, such as animals, insects, and entities such as minerals, or even, for that matter, of course, water. In other words, I'm trying to summon all life on that rock called the earth, human life, as well as the life of the plants and others, including the life of the rock itself. It goes without saying that the rock itself is part of uh, a bigger entity, uh, the universe, if by the universe we imply the physical planets and atoms as well as the metaphysical and spiritual aspects contained therein. So, uh, in my mind, the Earth as a category of thought, but also the Earth as a the manifestation of the last utopia, that Earth is a bit more than just a planet. It is a bit more than the biophysical, organic, and mineral order, without which life as such would not exist. It is a bit more than the global collective of the humanity, which inhabits it. If it is a bit more than all of that, what is it then, you may ask? I would say it is the living world in its multiplicity. It is the living world in its proliferation and in its capacity for dissemination. It's the living world, le vivant, we say in French, as le vivant undergoes its endless process of transformation, a transformation which has no omega point. Nor is it supposed to reach an apex 
or a, a moment of unification or totalization, as in the figure of Christ, hoped for by thinkers such as Taylor de Chardin. Taylor de Chardin, uh, who was a huge inspiration for uh, one of our most important poets, uh, uh, Leopold Sedar Senghor, did believe that indeed such was the destiny of life to one day in the future come together and uh, find a home in a figure he called Christ. In the process giving to the figure of Christ a kind of pan-cosmic um, char character uh, which was not very well uh, liked by, of course, uh, official theologians, at least in the church. So, what I'm saying is that in its open-endedness, the living world, the earth, with capital E, includes all creation. It includes the whole world. All the people, all the nations of the world, if, if you want. The artificial creations or works of humanity, the, um, the mass of things humanity has invented or depends upon for its existence, all mixed bodies, the whole physical universe, the spiritual and biological energies consistent with the definition of the living world. That is what I have in mind when I invoke the concept of the earth. So tonight, the question I would like to deal with is the following. To what extent can the earth, as a common roof and a common shelter for all its inhabitants, to what extent can the earth be the basis for a new idea, not of universalism or universality, as in the old narrative of human emancipation, but a new idea of community, or if you want, of the in common, especially at a time when repairing and sharing it, the earth, sharing it as equitably as possible, is the precondition for its habitability, for its durability, and for the sustainability of life on earth. That's the question I would like to bring to the discussions uh, for uh, this uh, seminar. In other words, can the earth thus described be considered as a community? What kind of community can it possibly be? Or does it actually form with the cohort of animate and inanimate species that inhabit it, have found refuge in it, or simply sojourn on it. So, that's, if you want, the, uh, the premise of the conversation I would like to uh, introduce. Now, you will uh, probably have noticed that this is a rather peculiar way of defining the earth. Let me just tell you that to define the earth in this manner, in the manner in which I have gestured towards, 
That is, in terms of the living world in its entirety and in its uh, innumerable manifestations, including, of course, technolog technological devices and other artificial or externalized apparatuses, to define the earth in this manner, in its myriad richness, I had to heavily draw on sources we are not used to. Maybe because we think they are insignificant. Maybe because they come from people who have, to quote Césaire, invented nothing. I had to heavily draw on an old African concept. The concept of general ecology, which we find in a number of myths, narratives, which we find also embodied in countless objects, most of which unfortunately are sequestered nowadays in Western museums, which uh, a number of us uh, have in mind thinkers such as Felwin Saar, the restitution of which we have been advocating as uh, uh, a way to achieve a certain form, if not of universal justice, at least of what we call in French, justice patrimoniale. So that's where I had to draw upon in order to put forward the uh, definition of the earth I have uh, proposed to for our conversation. Of course, uh, immediately you see the difficulty of drawing from such an archive. Why? Because not uh, long ago, what I call the old African concept of general ecology, in truth, an array of knowledges and practices, was derogatorily called animism. Animism itself was uh, considered to be a way of thinking, a way of acting, a way of uh, establishing rules of causality, which was, uh, I would say, arbitrarily assigned to so-called inferior societies, to so-called primitive people. I'm suggesting that what was der der derogatorily called animism was in fact a theory of general ecology, which we absolutely need now. And I will tell you why we need it now, which in fact we have always needed, but which we need now more than ever before for reasons uh, some of which are obvious to all of us, and others we still need to unearth, uh, if you want. Now let me tell you something about this general ecology, this concept, as practiced and as uh, theorized and sculpted by ancient Africans. At the core of this general ecology is the deep belief that the earth is more than just a rock. Let me start with that. As a matter of fact, in this general theory of general ecology, the earth is first and foremost, a community. 
It is a community of the living in its myriad richness. Animals, plants, rivers, mountains, microbes, viruses, but also all the invisible and obscure forces, the ancestors, their substitutes, together, of course, with the spirits and masks, the dances, the rituals, the ceremonies, funerals, and festivals. Of course, not all these things, not all these beings, because that's what they really are, not all these beings are of the same kind. And they are, strictly speaking, different forces and entities. But each in its own way, is a sketch of the living. Which is, if we want to expand our concept of the oasis, which is also in the uh, very nature of an oasis. An oasis is a sketch of habitability, if you want, that those spaces that are propitious to life. But sketches in the midst of inhospitality, of duress. Now, I have to tell you that there is a book I have been coming back to now, every time I really want to think, uh, I go back to that book. It is a novel that was published in 1952 by an author whose name is Amos Tutuola, a Nigerian author. And the title of the book is called The Palm Wine Drinkard. Amos Tutuola was, uh, was born in Yoruba land in southwest uh, uh, Nigeria. And uh, uh, he was not like Shoinka, he was not like Ben Okri. He had not gone to the university. He didn't re write properly, quote unquote, in English. That's why he, he uses terms like drinkard. The term drinkard, uh, for those of you who speak proper English, doesn't exist in English. It's, it's a pidgin term. It's invented out of uh, popular uh, modes of uh, verbalizing thought. So he wrote this book called The Palm Wine Drinkard. I mention this book because it paints a striking picture of the general ecology of which I'm trying to give you a few pointers because the whole seminar we could devote it to <laughs> general ecology, but we don't have uh, that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can think about it next time. Uh, so I'll just give you a few pointers so as to excite your both imagination and, and to bring you to, to pay attention to these uh, uh, archives uh, we think uh, do not matter. And yet they do. And yet they have never mattered as they do now. I refer here to African archives, I could, of course, uh, bring on board Amerindian archives as they are uh, translated to us uh, nowadays by uh, a number of uh, historians and anthropologists. So I'll give you three pointers of the concept of general ecology as it appears in these extremely interesting piece of work, the palm wine drinkard. First of all, 
significant within the paradigm that Amos Tutuola is uh, uh, forging, which itself relies on his deep understanding of Yoruba mythologies, but not simply Yoruba mythologies. These are mythologies we find among the Congo. We find them uh, among the Dogon, uh, further uh, uh, in the west. We find them down south among the Zulus uh, and other uh, uh, communities. So first of all, within this uh, paradigm, is how within the parameters of what I call uh, general ecology, how nothing formally prohibits anything at all from happening. Which means that, in fact, there is no absolute impossibility. Anything can happen. In other words, time and history are fundamentally open-ended. And by definition, nothing is mere continuous repetition of the same. Which means that the uh, the most astute or the most efficient human subject is a subject who is able constantly to change forms and to be opened to that which is unexpected which is, if you want, a position which is, by definition, against calculation. It's against calculation. He could have, to Tuola, if he were a philosopher, give as a title to his book, Against Calculation. And I think that the very idea of a palm wine drinker, meaning somebody who's drunk, I mean, it calls for that. It calls against calculation. That when you are drunk, you don't, I mean, you are free, completely free. Everything, anything can happen the moment you are drunk. And this is what happens precisely to the figure, the hero, of the novel. So, general ecology, that's its first principle. Second, the second principle is that uh, there is nothing passive or inert, which goes against, of course, I mean, you understand this, most of the uh, materialist philosophies formulated in the West, beginning from Parmenides up to uh, right now. The idea that only the subject is active, especially when operating against an object which is, by definition, supposedly inert or passive. And the uh, subject, of course, being the human. So, there's nothing passive or inert and taken in isolation, no entity, no force has full control over its freedom or its destiny. I could expand on this. Uh, we don't have much time for that. There's a third principle that is constitutive of this general ecology. It's uh, 
prise de position, un parti pris. It's a, it's a statement on life, on the nature of life. In the sense that when you read Tutuola, Tutuola's concept of life presents later as, um, how should I put it, fact that life has an arborescent quality. And because it has an arborescent quality, it contains a multitude of possible futures. More importantly, it's not life. It's not only woven of uncertainties, but randomness is part of its uh, very definition. And somewhat, life is akin to a dice game in the sense that it is always exposed to disintegration and as every risk threatens to turn into an existential risk, the living subject is one that is prepared for incessant mutations and is ever able to change its state. So when you read the book, I mean, the hero constantly is called upon to change. To, he loses one leg there, he borrows another leg somewhere else, then he's decapitated during a war. He finds himself in the midst of a war. And then he borrows an, uh, the head of somebody else. He puts it on top of his body. But of course, all of this entails many, many problems because the head he has <laughs> found I mean, in the battlefield, it has this peculiarity that it speaks all the time. So it's like, okay, uh, Kader is decapitated. It won't happen to you. And then he borrows a head somewhere else. But that head is constantly talking. And worse, it is constantly revealing his deep, secret intentions. So he can't really predict anything. Everybody knows what he's going to do. So it's not as if all of this is smooth. It comes with uh, contradictions. And finally, another parameter of this general ecology is the idea that relationality takes precedence over identity. This is absolutely important, especially for current debates, global debates on identity. In fact, if we take seriously <clears throat> African metaphysics, that is what they say. Relation, or if you want to use a big word, relationality, takes precedence over identity. Precisely because of the um, exigency for any efficient subject to constantly mutate. So if you are constantly mutating, identity as defined, especially in Greek philosophy, Western philosophy, doesn't make sense. You won't survive on the basis of identity. You will survive on the basis of your capacity to connect, to link up, to weave links, to sketch, constantly sketch dynamic assemblages. That's how you achieve social durability. Uh, if you want. Social durability in an earth which is a sort of binder. 
because uh, it makes the passage from one form to another possible, the whole idea of metamorphosis. And because it is the receptacle of every single form of life, the earth also assumes the properties of a vibratorium. I don't know whether the term exists in, in English, in case you just invented it. If it doesn't exist, you invent it. So, from a general ecology perspective, if there is one enigma that most myths and ancestral knowledge strive to, to solve, it is that of knowing how to pass from one world to another. From one form to another. There's the idea of le passant, the passerby. That somewhat, from the perspective of the earth, of course we are citizens, but we are fundamentally passers-by. We are inhabitants of the earth and passers-by. And um, in so doing, we give life to what is threatened with demise. And this function of giving life to that which is threatened from demise was assigned to technical objects, beginning, of course, with the mask uh, as the eminent and indeed first form of commemoration of, of the dead. This task was also assigned to liturgical materials such as, for instance, throwing sticks uh, among the dogon in particular, the stones on which the newborns are placed for their official naming, those on which uh, the sanctuary's wooden statues rest, or the, uh, the turtles uh, said to, to represent an ancestor, or even the snake uh, that comes of uh, a knight uh, to lick and clean the priest, which was especially the case among the, the Bambara. So you, you see there's an ele a poetic and oniric element uh, in all of this, uh, which makes of, of the earth somewhat of a mystery, uh, a um, mis uh, mis mysterious, mi mysterious, how do you say mysterious? Mysterious part uh, uh, of the earth um, indeed, uh, those cultures did strive to, to maintain because uh, uh, in this case, I mean, the whole idea of disenchantment uh, it doesn't work here. You, you need a space, some vector for constant re-enchantment uh, uh, as opposed to uh, the whole project of disenchantment uh, which has led us to where we are today. And in that sense, technology or technical objects were utensils of, of life. I could go on and on on this, but you, uh, I'm sure you, you understand, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, uh, the architecture uh, uh, I'm referring to and the way in which uh, it is somewhat in, in conflict uh, with the, uh, the general movement uh, of, of our times. So let me now uh, say that such was the case yesterday. Where are we today? What are those changes of our times which call precisely for the kind of agenda Elvira was delineating for uh, the institution of the museum, but also a whole variety of other institutions. Because what you were saying, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's not only valid for the museum. It seems to me that among all the, uh, the brutal changes that affect the living 
in this age on earth, three in particular deserve to be examined from the kind of general ecology perspective I have just outlined. And I will now go through those three. There are many more, but uh, I'm interested in three. The first, thanks to the world's ongoing combustion, the first concerns the possible exit from the climate niche in which humans and non-humans have thrived for the past 6,000 years. And here I'm borrowing from the most recent work on climate change, which I'm summarizing in one sentence, I borrow from uh, Bruno Latour, the idea that we are exiting from the climate niche which humans and non-humans have thrived for the past 6,000 years. Getting out of it. For uh, though the planet's regions are not impacted equally or to the same extent, overheating, uh, combustion, overheating is real everywhere. It is real everywhere to the point where we can begin to think of the time when oxygen will be affected with scarcity. Opening, therefore, the um, way, paving the way for a radical vulnerability of bodies, and not only of human bodies. A radical vulnerability of all bodies which will no longer appear as accidental. It will become systemic. And some of us know something about the radical vulnerabilization of bodies. Such as uh, in the historical events of the slave trade or the movement from Africa to the New World, what is called the Middle Passage. We know something about the radical vulnerabilization of bodies in the context of the plantation. We know something about the radical vulnerabilization of bodies including during the times of reconstruction in the United States of America. And we know something about it, including today. I do not need to refer here to instances put in stark evidence by a movement such as Black Lives Matter. So there are historical antecedents to what might come. And as the planet becomes ever smaller, which it is becoming, if only in the sense that we are now forced to live exposed to each other, and there's no way going back, there won't be a time in the coming history of our communities when we will live within pure communities. That dream is over. And as the planet becomes ever smaller, of course the utopia of limitless growth has run its course. 
study after study shows that we will inevitably reach thresholds, lethal thresholds, if nothing is done, resulting in heat exchange blockages, protein deformation, the destruction of muscle cells, and poor blood circulation. And this will jeopardize more than the human body's cooling mechanisms. The Earth's body itself, its vital organs, will fail in an interconnected change. So that's the first change. It seems to me, critical thought, museum practices, has to face. The second change is planetarization, which is not exactly the same thing as globalization. A key driver of the process of planetarization is platform capitalism. We are currently ruled by the market. I mean, if there is one form of world government, if you want to use that kind of language, is the market. That, that in fact, <laughs> we live under one, one, one common form of government. Is the market. Why? Because the later has become a totality. It wasn't always like that. In fact, in the aftermath of the Second World War, we began to see a kind of, uh, how should I call it? And you read, uh, what's his name again? Um, Polanyi, the Great Transformation. We began to see the extent to which the state and the market began to exercise a check on each other. Since the, the beginning of the 80s and more importantly the 90s, that capacity of the state to check on the market has collapsed. The state everywhere in the world is now ruled by the market and in particular by financial markets. So the market has become a totality. It has also become our core moral experience. But so has technology. Both the market and technology now set the rules and procedures according to which we are obliged to live together as a collective body within new planetary limits. And this we see <clears throat> with the multiplication of digital ecosystems and uh, put together, of course, these digital ecosystems now form what is known indeed as platform capitalism, one of the main drivers of planetarization. So that's the second major change we will have to face. The third change concerns the world into which we have already entered, which will be dominated by computational reason. in the sense, of course, that gigantic uh, computing devices uh, will be, uh, to the 21st century, what the alliance of steel and concrete was to the 19th and 20th centuries. In other words, technology, digital technology in particular, is going more than ever before to be 
one of the fundamental forces of our world. It will provide this world with a semblance of unity, but will also drag it into a process of splintering and endless fragmentation. More than this, technology, digital technology, will be our environment, <clears throat> the territory in which we move, or if you want, our biotope. And it is thanks to and through it that uh, new languages will appear, they are already appearing, that the living will have its coexistence organized, that other ways of making or breaking the world will emerge. I could go on and on this. What I mean, in short, is that te digital technology has become the new magnetic field of all earthly existence. Uh, I think that summarizes it uh, uh, well. The third key change has to do with the kind of the form of power that the two first uh, big transformations have made possible. I think that all the above, the two major changes I have highlighted, there are many more, has led to the advent of a new form of power, let's just call it mutant power. M-U-T-A-N-T, -T power. A kind of power whose properties are invisibility and often unde undetectability. And this uh, power is fundamentally predicated on the predation of the living. I think that mutant power has a twofold dimension. First of all, it is radioactive in a nuclear sense. We thought we had exited the nuclear age. That is not true at all. In the 70s in particular, or in any case at the height of the Cold War, critical thinking took the question of the nuclear very seriously. By the time we reached the 80s, it abandoned it, or more or less. <clears throat> and yet, the nuclear is still our future. And what I'm saying is that the new forms of power that are emerging out of some of the transformations I have briefly sketched has among its many attributes the fact that it is radi radioactive. Radioactive in the sense that it is irradiant. It has a second property. It is viral. And because it is viral, it is hugely parasitic because that's precisely the uh, definition of viruses. Viruses are parasitic by definition. So it's a kind of power that moves either by irradiation or in the viral mode. I'll just refer you to the work of a Japanese thinker called Sabu Koso, who has been um, on the basis of the uh, uh, exp tragic experience in uh, Fukushima, or is it Fukushima? Uh, on the basis of this major event, where you have uh, probably for the first time in history, the uh, the um, co um, uh, 
the, the, the coming together of a nuclear disaster and a climatic disaster because you have the tsunami and, and the nuclear explosion all in one thing. Very different from when the bomb was thrown onto Nagasaki and Hiroshima. This is not the Hiroshima moment. Uh, Sabu is reflecting on an entirely different moment when these two cataclysmic forces, the force of the nuclear and the force of the geological and the marine, all of that, come together. So I refer you to uh, his work and um, the extent to which he is interested in the genetic mutations that are generated by these two uh, catastrophes. And he shows the extent to which the, this kind of power which is unleashed partly through human action and partly through actions that uh, they pass, uh, go beyond uh, the control of the human, how indeed this kind of power uh, is, uh, um, let's say, uh, has as one of its properties uh, uh, the capacity to, to travel uh, uh, and, and, and to infect, uh, uh, if you want. So those are three uh, key uh, changes, I think, um, uh, interrogate uh, deeply the uh, paradigm of general ecology uh, as uh, I, I was trying to, uh, to uh, delineate it. I have here huge amounts of uh, 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 material on, of course, uh, all of this. I will uh, pass through it and um, let's see now try to conclude this set of uh, remarks by, first of all, um, uh, uh, making a statement, I can uh, explain it later on, uh, and, and therefore adding to, to the three changes I have highlighted, the fourth being, uh, as I think loudly, uh, the fourth being, the, of course, the fact that um, what we do now have uh, is, is the emergence, I would say, of a second body of the earth. And the technosphere is now the second body of, of the earth. Now, let me uh, bring all of this uh, hopefully together uh, before I, I end. Why is it that I believe the Earth, as I try to define it, is our last utopia? I'll end with that. i end with the fact that from a general ecology perspective of the kind I have outlined, <clears throat> uh, let's see, uh, it is possible indeed to consider seriously the proposition that the Earth is our last utopia. And here I'll go back briefly to African systems of thought and the ways in which they have imagined our relationship with the Earth. In these systems of thought, such a relationship has never been merely economic. The relationship with the earth has always been a quasi-existential one, by which I mean one of exchange, exchange in so far as the material that is the earth, is imprinted in us. It is imprinted in us at the same time as it receives our imprints. 
at the same time as it receives or it embraces our memory. At the same time as it <coughs> recueillir, um, it hosts, if you want, our traces, the traces we leave behind. The material remains of disappeared bodies, the bodies of uh, all those who, born of the earth, have returned to it. That's how in these systems of thought and practice, the earth has been imagined, which makes of it a de facto community. And this is also what makes the earth flesh, the flesh of ancestors. It is also what makes death itself, at least under certain circumstances, a libation. Because in the earth, a symbol of permanence, or if you want, durability, or we should say today, sustainability, being sheds its perishable envelope of a body, and being is stabilized. If it is indeed true that to die means to go into the earth or in some cultures to arise as aroma to the heavens, then death is ultimately a way of nourishing the earth. That's what we see, for instance, in Dogon cosmology. Its function is to reaffirm the principle of consubstantiality between the soil and the human person. But as I was suggesting early on, in its other sense, which I'm employing here, the earth is also that which one can only move across. I mean, we can't carry it. Let's say we own a, a piece of land. My father used to own a piece of land in Cameroon. When he died, of course, he left the piece of land behind him. He couldn't carry it. We cannot carry it. We we'll leave it behind. Which means that the earth is precisely that which one can only move across. The figure of the passerby, as opposed to that of the citizen. Because in the ideology of citizenship, there is somewhere a sense that, you know, it belongs to us and we, carry it, we will carry it with us through the principle of property, property ownership. But what I'm saying is that from a general ecology perspective, forget about it. What we have to assume is our condition as passers-by. And if we take it seriously as an object of political thinking, then we have to move beyond concepts of citizenship or we have to supplement such concepts with other ones consonant with the idea of the earth as common. I could go on and on and on. I think I'll just stop there and allow for uh, uh, a conversation and I thank you very much for your attention.
Mientras nuestros compañeros nos ayudan. Gracias, Achille. Incredible. Uh, so many things we need to talk about now. But while we waiting for the, the structure to be made so we can join you in the table, I just want to say that I made a mistake. So Fede Rata, uh, I want to say here, <laughs> is Miriam Rubio, no, Ingrid Rubio, as I say. <laughs> and then Ingrid Blanco, of course, because I don't know what it is, is here. I miss, I mean, I miss, which together with Cristina Mercader have been the people that have helped us and continues to help every day for the pay to be possible. But also I want to highlight the fact that every now and then we have some other figures, like now here, uh, Nancy Garin, like Tania Adams somewhere, like also Cristina Goberna, who's there somewhere, that help us also to do this collective reading. But now, as I said, the, we will talk more about this in the days to come. Uh, but now we had to be joined by Mas Jorge and, and Kader to continue the conversation with Achil. And, and please be ready because the idea is that we will start the conversation among us and you will also be part of this. Uh, so at some point I will, I will ask for your, uh, for your participation. Shall I go? Yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, maybe, uh, maybe. Uh, so uh, we will continue in English, so then the the you no know, the relationship between us is easier. Um, thank you so much, Chil. I don't know where to start. I have so many incredible. Uh, I could I could bring so many of the things that you said uh, through the conversation. I was. Uh, very uh, excited that at the end you went back to recover the notion of the passerby and our possibility to um, to inhabit Earth as any other living, and to also not sustain the privilege that make us uh, let's say not sustain a privilege that we consider we have as a subject, right? In relation to to that that is um, the possibility of considering ourselves in relation. Right? Instead of like, uh, or in, uh, as you, you mentioned earlier as well, no, no, not only re relationality, no, that takes precedent over identity. So that for us, I think, is extremely crucial, no, to consider, to consider that. Um, and I, I perhaps I don't want to be the the, the first one to uh, to uh, because there are many things, and of course I had read the, your paper, so I'm I'm like, I oh, know I wanted him to talk about this and that. <laughs> So I don't want to to begin, but I'm going to give my the word to my colleagues here uh, to to start to 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 take some of the issues that also to ask you to elaborate some of some of the perspectives. So I don't know if you want to begin, Kader. I mean, thank you, thank you, Elvira, thank you, Ashil, very much. As Elvira said, there are I mean uh, a lot of points here to digest. <laughs> It will take us a lot of time. In the end, to make it short, so that I don't speak too long, I would say that I would ask you the question, because it's still fresh in my mind, about this important moment which, uh, where you referred, I think, to your father and the land, the small land he had, and then he passed away. We know that kind of story. I mean, it reminds me also the one of my, of my father. But what I want to raise here is something that I think you did not speak or you maybe try to, is how much, uh, I would say, talking about ownership, about owning a land, the property, there's something that, that we really have to uh, understand and incarnate in our minds today. If you said that one of the four uh, uh, changes that are crucial to understand the evolution of our world is basically this sort of virtual technologic extension of Earth on the digital. We have to understand that the digital is becoming owned by the GAMFA. Mm -hmm. And what Shoshana Zuboff explained in her book, uh, Capital Surveillance Capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a point we have to work on. Because basically, the parallel that we can do, we could do with colonialism, uh, I'm not talking about coloniality, but colonialism, and digital colonialism is this moment where we take for granted that things are free to take and claim and say, okay, this is mine now, like the La, La Conference de Berlin, uh, the, the Berlin Conference on Africa. 
And I think this, this, this is an important detail, Achille, because I don't think that technologically we are passing through. On the contrary, all the theory of trans um, humanism is saying that basically the aim of the GAMFA now is to make us living forever, which means that this virtual a huge handless lands is mm. questionable in terms of who owns it, because who owns it means who decides who decides what. Mm -hmm. So I, w I, want, I wanted to raise this. I think it's. Uh... Should we take a few? Or just I got to you. Yes, you. Yeah. So, you prefer to allow me to think a bit. Before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, in the uh, no, Max, yes. if you want to go ahead, stay forward. <laughs> Otherwise, I formulate. Yeah, shall I go? You go ahead. Uh, also, thinking in, in you had talked about like I think is is very important in the technosphere. I don't want to change it too much, but there is something that you mentioned, which has to do with also the traces that we leave behind. And without going to the technological aspect, which is what uh, Kader ha highlighted, I was thinking in, in, in something that you uh, mentioned in the paper that you haven't talked about it today, but I was wondering in, in, in these imprint memories, as an, in, in the, your articulation uh, or your critique to the Anthropocene and the, what you call the era of the techno-libertarianism, no? like how that um, is connected with that uh, the, the most of the, tr the traces that we leave behind, no? that sentence that for me uh, referred to it. And, and, and to me, this is very important. And I was trying to, I, I wish I, I would have read um, Amos Tutola, which I read a long time ago. And I remember certain things, but I, and I'm gonna go back to it uh, tomorrow. But, but, the, the, but there is something also, I thought that could be interesting for us is to, to talk about um, if this was, death was a libation. Um, is we are talking about, uh, you know, the, against animism in a way, right? What, are, what is the ritual and what does the ritual invoke in, the, in, in connection to what you are presenting us, right? Like, what is, what is the, the world, uh, as Amos Tutola presented in, in terms of um, ritual as an institution, right? Like, in, in terms of that formulation of, mm. of an institution, in which way... Uh, can we address uh, that that uh, that invocation, that sense of the ritual in here, right? Like how whether they have a space or not within this general ecology, and what that it means, right? Because I think you mentioned at the very beginning what is and, and it has to do with your work on repair and, and restitution, Kader, no? There is something about institutional making that is also built on the the structures and the objects that are concealed to, to that, uh, that are limited of their relation and, and, and as a passerby. No? If, we, if we take your thing that, um, that the, the, the living is, uh, that the, all living subjects that are not in there, they are not passive, right? If we take that into account, there is something about to, that needs to be said about how ritual, how the invocation of those, how those memories, the imprint of memories that, that generate no, this series of invocation as institution come to assistance, right? And I wonder if there is something that has to do or not, but in a way I, I'm thinking about uh, how you know, the word of Tutola also look at the technology of the ritual. I think that's also very important for me. Max. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Ashu. Um, <coughs> truly uh, inspiring, I would say. So it gives me a lot uh, to think, and um, it's good if we talk a bit so I get more chance to think about more, <laughs> more issues. Um, and also, obviously, we will open um, to, to the general public. Um, I have a question which has to do with uh, what I perceived um, as a, let's say, an inherent contradiction of what you say. I, just to make it clear, I, I like contradictions. <laughs> um, so, but there, there's one that I felt, and it's something that I felt, so I would like to ask you if you could uh, elaborate on that. So you do talk about um, the living totality, which was the point of departure where, where you took us. You talked about um, uh, 
um, the living totality being the last utopia. And you described the living totality as, uh, as an endless process of transformation without an omega point, without an apex. So the endless process of transformation without, without omega point nor apex contrasts with some of the things that you highlighted about, you know, change. We exiting the niche, the climate niche of 6,000 years. Uh, it contrasts with, uh, with uh, highlighting the limits, you know, the limitedness of what can be extracted by the market. It, it contrasts with uh, what you call a massive vulnerabilization of life. Uh, and it contrasts with what you described as the last utopia, because the last utopia is a, is a last thing. It's not an endless transformation that has no omega point or, or right? So um, I can understand that this tension is one that creates um, urgency and uh, we were talking about urgency. So I would be interested, you know, there's two possible questions. One is, uh, <laughs> if this is the last utopia, was there one before? And, uh, and, <laughs> and the, kind of obvious, uh, the kind of obvious question is, if, if we fail with this last utopia, we, we die. <laughs> It's a Maxis a philosopher, everybody. <laughs> a German one. <laughs> Start with the last mm -hmm. <laughs> question and then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> okay. First of all, thank you uh, very much for uh, responding to. Um, to whatever I try to say mm -hmm. in such a short notice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, uh, Max, there, there's a tension uh, willfully built in the, uh, in, in the presentation. <clears throat> um, what kind of tension? Uh, a tension um, that aims at uh, highlighting, as you yourself put it, uh, a sense of, uh, of urgency, um, a sense that <clears throat> maybe um, time is, is counted, um, that, that we, we can no longer afford, let's say, to, to wait in indefinitely, and the question of waiting, Kader, mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about at, at lunchtime, that there is a there is a moment when waiting uh, is no longer um, advisable, a and God knows uh, the uh, what has been the importance of waiting, in 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 particular. Um, African diasporic uh, political imagination, uh, the theme of waiting, for instance, in <clears throat> during during the times of slavery, uh, the the trope of waiting um, during the civil rights movement in the theology of someone like Martin Luther King, the uh, the question of of the impossibility of waiting any longer, uh, for instance, in in James Baldwin's uh, work. So there comes a moment when, when, when <clears throat> waiting and patience um, are, are no longer affordable. Uh, because uh, w what is coming uh, might, might uh, m carry with it um, um, incalculable uh, consequences. Uh, back to this question of calculability and incalculability. So, so, so the tension between the last 
and the uh, kind of endless transformation uh, I was referring to, uh, that tension is built in, in that larger, larger uh, problematic. Now, of course, the idea of um, a process of transformation that basically has no apex um, is, is double-edged. It is double-edged uh, partly because, in fact, it is, uh, to put it very simply, um, a key ingredient of, uh, just to put it uh, uh, roughly, uh, neoliberal ideologies of innovation. Um, innovation for the sake of innovation. Transformation for the sake of transformation. And uh, uh, techno-libertarianism uh, precisely relies on, on that idea. The idea that uh, transformation might be delinked from any, any final end, ultimate meaning. Uh, and because it is delinked from meaning, uh, uh, it becomes uh, a sheer cynicism, uh, if, if you want, or uh, an expression of sheer nihilism. And it seems to me that we somewhat uh, live in that age of, of nihilism. And, and that uh, this age of nihilism is, is to a large extent um, uh, fueled by the kind of technological escalation we, we are witnessing. And um, um, a kind of technological escalation which finds precisely its, uh, its uh, manifestation in, in the attempt by technology to take more and more the um, attributes of, of religion, religion, religious thought. Um, or uh, because until relatively uh, recently, um, it, it was presumed, for instance, that the, um, the artificial object uh, made humans more, um, more remote from, from the, uh, the real world. Um, now it seems to me that the artificial object, uh, the technological object, has become a vector of, uh, of fusion, um, or in any case, potential fusion, uh, since the world itself has become artificial. I don't know whether you see what, what, what I mean. Um, what I mean is that the, uh, the idea today in techno-libertarian ideology is that to inhabit the world means to engage uninterruptedly with matter, with forms, with objects. Uh, it means immersion in, in, the, uh, in the sensible uh, uh, direct relationship with, with matter uh, uh, in its uh, uh, ob objectivity. So, so uh, w what seems to be going on then is, is something thinkers like Leroy Gourand, who, whom uh, I refer to in the text, uh, did, did somewhat predict. Leroy Gourand, who was a French paleontologist, uh, or something like that, um, was, was very worried, uh, this was in the 50s already, uh, of the moment when, when um, the world of objects would be delinked from the world of, of meaning, of symbols. Um, the world of object, the artificial world we build, we create, he called le geste. Mm -hmm. 
that which we do with, of course, our hands, but our hands interacting with our, uh, our brain, and then we produce, for instance, a bottle. Um, he was worried about the fact that le geste, the production of tools, would be delinked from the production of meaning, which he calls la parole, or the speech of symbols. And uh, uh, this was, of course, before the digital revolution. My feeling is that that fear is uh, ever more uh, saturating our existence today than uh, in the 50s, in the sense that technology will become the pure force in and of itself with no accountability uh, that uh, certain critiques, Heidegger and others, have, have elaborated upon. So, 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 Max, the tension you are highlighting, uh, its background is all these, these considerations. But I find it useful because as a device, uh, it helps to, to focus the, uh, uh, the eye on, onto what, what is really a, at stake. And part of what is at stake, uh, Elvira, is what you were talking about, um, what you were suggesting, um, especially in relation to our condition as, as passer, passersby. Because the idea of a passerby is not exactly the uh, idea the kind of idea somebody like Kant uh, plays with in his um, work on perpetual peace. The work on perpetual peace is, is more or less an attempt at dealing with uh, this idea of, of, of what is common to us. Uh, what is it that we share? What is it that um, makes us not the other of anybody, but le semblable? The term in French is le semblable. I say this because, in fact, a lot of the uh, philosophies of emancipation which have um, been produced, especially in the aftermath of the Second uh, or the, even the First World War, rest somewhat on some idea of uh, of the other, uh, of identity and difference. The likes of Levinas being, of course, I mean the big philosopher of the other and of the faith, uh, of which we talked about in Gottingen uh, long ago. Um, why is it that I'm referring to this? I'm referring to this from Kant to Levinas because when you read Kant, I mean Kant still believe in, in, in a world of states, basically. Mm. Although he opens the door for the question of hospitality, but conditional hospitality, in the sense that we belong to nation states, and, and yet we also belong to the world, mm. a world that unfortunately in his mind does not have <clears throat> uh, a common instance of government. And I was just saying that we do have one, which is the market. We do have another one, which is technology. Those are our two uh, common instances of, of world government, if you want. Informal, of course, but nevertheless uh, uh, tangible. And therefore, in that world of states, which have to interact, 
I, the other, am entitled to knock at your door. But you have the right to not open the door. Except if not opening the door will uh, expose my life. In which case, you have to do something according to Kant. But if we look at this from the figure of the passerby, then we move beyond the Kantian conditionality. Mm -hmm. Because the fact that we are all first and foremost passers-by creates a, a terrain, an originary terrain, in which radical equality becomes invisible and has to be translated in a set of unconditional rights which are attached to the fact of us being inhabitants first and foremost of our common earth. So that's the, uh, the, uh, the gesture uh, uh, I'm trying to, uh, to make, and which explains, therefore, the importance of uh, the, the concept of the, the passers-by. And I think that uh, in so doing, I also touch a little bit upon uh, Kader, your, your question on ownership. Because there's a moment, you see, <laughs> the, the contrary to Schmidt, I believe that the first moment, the originary moment of our existence has to do precisely not with ownership, but with a debt of, of life. That, that debt is at the beginning, indeed, of, of it all. Because we come into being, not because we have, we have uh, asked for it. I mean, I, I don't know any of us who asked to be here, to, 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 to be born. We never asked for it. None of us asked for it. None of us, let's say, takes his or her origin from having us to, to exist. So there is this originary debt which we owe to rather than own. So owing as opposed to owning, it seems to me uh, is precisely the, the point where I would like to address, Kader, your, your question of ownership and property. Hmm. Questions of ownership and property have to be interrogated from the point of view of owing as opposed to owning. And of course, there are many different forms of debt. There are forms of expropriatory debt, like uh, Haiti having to pay for, 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 for becoming free. But there are also constitutive debts mm -hmm. without which the very idea of community is impossible to even contemplate. So it seems to me that that's the driving wedge if we want to renew today a critique of, of, of property in all its, uh, its senses, in order precisely to make possible some thinking about the world as our common, common earth. So, so that's, uh, I'm sorry I was too long, <laughs> but your questions were so big. Uh, no, to, to it's fantastic. Some. I don't know if there is a mic in the, in the space. I don't know if you want to respond immediately to what he has said, but I think yeah, it's time. On Friday, exactly. We do it on Friday during our session. But I think it's, it's a moment also for for you guys in the audience to address your questions to to Achille. And I think it's, it's, it's critical that you we can hear you. That's the reason why this is open. It's overt. overt. Um, so I don't know if anybody um, wants to start. I don't know. Breaking the ice. Do I need to say that no question is a wrong question? <laughs> Don't worry if you have nothing to say. <laughs> you can be absolutely fine with me. Also, of course, uh, you know, we go earlier to dinner. But, uh, but I think it's an opportunity if you, if you feel like it. Um, I give you a little bit more time to warm up. Um, I th there's something you say earlier also. Uh, 
uh, about the oasis that I love. If I, I, I don't know if I would be able to find it, no. But uh, but I but I also want to like how can in in this sense and you at some point mentioned no the important that the 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 role that we have as institutions right to embrace aspect of the general ecology as um, something that we could. Uh, engage with, no? which actually call for uh, an, uh, an installation of the passerbys that I think as part of the, like I, I, as an institution that is a passerby structure, I don't know how to say, is the possibility of an institution that contains that relationality that allows us to, that will allow for a different, because I, a kind of engagement, because I feel like if it's not identity, there is something else that limits and traps us within the institution, that perhaps we don't have that possibility or span in the way that general ecology asks us for. You see, for me, uh, a decolonized institution, mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, if we were to imagine it, <clears throat> would precisely be uh, predicated on, on, on these two ideas of, of general ecology and of the passer, passerby, le passant, and of course of the in common, mm. those three concepts. Um, that, that is what a decolonized institution, whether a museum or a university, uh, would look like. <clears throat> and um, in, in looking like that, for instance, the whole idea of restitution, which has been, mm. I'm sure that we'll talk about it again before the end of this seminar, uh, uh, next day, few days, uh, which has been so central to uh, contemporary debate on, on justice, on universal justice. Mm -hmm. and that the, the, the big discussions worldwide on the idea of universal justice as one of the conditions for the durability of life on earth. That if, if we want life on earth to, to not come to a premature end, we need to work for forms of justice that attend to all the injustices, historical and present, of all the living world. This is a key debate of our times. So the question of restitution is part of that debate. It's not just, okay, they stole this, now they have to give it back. It's more than that. It's about how it is that taking into account a long history of expropriation, and a long history of erasure, a long history of some having their foot on others' necks or trying to break their neck. How do we move from that to reinventing what it means to relate to oneself, to each other, and to the universe or the world at large, in any case, as I have tried to describe it. Which means <clears throat> some idea of general reconciliation. Reconciliation which should be predicated on making a space to all. Because that's what the earth is. The earth does not discriminate. If there's a property of the earth, with capital E, it's the, the fact that it doesn't know how to discriminate because it makes a space to so many of us, not only humans, but all, all kinds of, the multiplicity of, of, of species. So the question of restitution has to be understood from within that, that, that realm of how do we reinvent what universal justice might, might possibly mean, or planetary justice. 
Now, I don't remember why is it that I'm talking about this. <laughs> uh, Because we were waiting for somebody to ask a question. Waiting, okay, so. Venga, two questions. You see, there is always. <laughs> there are two questions. We will take both, uh, and then uh, you respond, or more. So we have two at the moment. Oh, hola, Three. buenas noches. Is your hat question? Perdón, okay. ahora. <laughs> eh, sí, sí. Eh, bueno, lo haré en español, entonces. Sí. Bueno, primero quiero agradecer mucho el poder estar aquí y, y tenerle reunido. Son eh, saberes que he venido escuchando, leyendo a Max desde hace algunos años. Y bueno, me hace pensar mucho eh, desde mi condición, desde mis territorios, eh, especialmente desde Latinoamérica, y en, en especial desde México. Y... Considero eh, primero que, claro, es una, una gran reflexión y me hace eh, ir hacia un pensamiento, digamos, desde una cosmogonía mesoamericana del, del tiempo cíclico, ¿no? Y cómo es que rompemos con, se rompe con esta línea de la historia y de la universalidad, ¿no? Y pensar en la multiplicidad de los universos. Eh, y en esa medida pienso en eventos y uno de ellos es... Eh, la caída del, del meteorito en Xuxulup, en, uh -huh. en la península de Yucatán, lo, que, lo cual provoca una transformación climática uh -huh. que a lo largo de cientos de años eh, extingue a los dinosaurios, ¿no? a nuestros ancestros. Uh -huh. Enlazado con la caída de, eh, de la bomba nuclear y cómo es que esto ha venido provocando, ¿no? Y con ello también en otros eventos como eh, los levantamientos o las enunciaciones eh, campesinas, indígenas, en la, en la final de, lo, de los 60, principios de los 70, y como me lleva a pensar también en, en Butunit, eh, la matanza en Arizona, ¿no? con, la, con los pueblos Nakota, Dakota, Lakota, y cómo después se vuelve a conectar con eh, Standing Rocks, ¿no? uh -huh. este movimiento también que se enlaza con eh, Black, el, eh, Black, Black Matters. Uh -huh. Y bueno, todo ello para, para pensar en cómo es que desde esos momentos se ha venido enunciando eh, desde estas latitudes que hay otros saberes, que, que somos parte de... ¿no? y que el mundo está dentro de nosotros y somos parte de. Y eso me lleva a pensar a una imagen, más bien me trae el recuerdo de una imagen. Eh, estábamos con una bióloga marina, un grupo de artistas, eh, frente a Xuxulup, uh -huh. y ella levanta la arena y dice, bueno, esto pasó hace cientos de miles de años, hace poco, en realidad. ¿no? Uh -huh. somos, solo somos un parpadeo que de nuevo vuelve a romper con nuestro antropocentrismo. ¿no? Pensándolo también en cómo el maracame, el, el, el chamán Wirrarica, está cantando en la noche frente al, frente al fuego y la montaña, el fuego, los vientos, los diferentes espíritus le están hablando y él les está hablando. Y estos les están, les están anunciando que necesitamos volver a conectarnos. ¿No? Me hace, me hace, todo esto me hace pensar y recordar esos momentos y bueno, quería, quería expresarlo, ¿no? que creo que, y la pregunta es, ¿por qué no se integra eh, en estas reflexiones esta, estos otros saberes? ¿no? Gracias. Vamos a coger la segunda y la tercera que anda un poco más atrás. Segunda justo en esa cuarta línea, ¿sí? Um, okay. The, uh, first of all, thank you all very much for this um, talk. Um, as as you said, that Chile life has has been central to this to this uh, seminar, and I wanted to note that um, I think life cannot be thought um, in an abstract way. And as uh, I think you have addressed in other works, life and also death cannot be thought outside of the forms and mechanisms that regulate it and discipline it. 
Um, I think um, this way of thinking life outside of this mechanism and, and forms of regulation um, is now present in some proposals, some feminist proposals such as Silvia Federici, I think, and I think they take the risk of affirming this um, abject or and feminized positions, these positions created by these processes of vulnerabilization that you've talked about, mm. um, and, and celebrate them rather than abolish them or confront them in a um, in a well, in the in the in the in the midst of the of the struggle, right? So I wanted to ask you how does general ecology helps us think um, of abolitionist practices that don't celebrate or affirm these positions marked by uh, oppression and exposition to death? I think there is última person, no? Al final, sí. Yo creo que cogeremos esas y como Achille se va a enrollar mucho, serán las últimas. Así que si queréis hacerla, pues la pregunta. Um, Hay una, cua, dos preguntas más. Uh, shall we take all of them? Sure, yes. yes. So go that ahead? one and then two more. Please shall go I? ahead. Sí, por favor. Okay. Um, I work in technology and um, uh, every day I see and I, I am put in front of the fact that there is a, a gap even more, a bigger, 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 every bigger, every day between the people who work in technology and who see what's happening really with what is being uh, uh, worked with and the advances in all the different areas of technologies and the gap between this gap between these people I'm a part of and people who are users of technology and who most of the time uh, do not know um, what are the impact of these technologies on themselves and on the environment and on a bigger area. Mm -hmm. So um, I've worked more, uh, over the past few years, I've come to work more on the ethical questions because it is a critical aspect of, of our world today that more people work in, in, in these aspects of technology and also the ecological consequences of technologies. And um, um, my question is, um, do you think that the, the tools which have been developed in, uh, the, the addre in addressing, with addressing um, um, colonialism can be used to address the colonialism of technology? Or do you think that new tools should be discovered or constructed and can you give us uh, some, uh, your point of view on that? And that address also the, the, the other uh, participant. I would be really uh, appreciative. And thank you again for uh, your talks and for organizing these, uh, mm -hmm. these uh, talks. There are two more, one in the first row and then the one that back. And that will be, I think, we all want to stay here forever, but <laughs> forever is a long time. <laughs> Oh, you have one. Oh, sorry. So three more. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you, and whoever professor. Whoever has to go, has to go. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. I'm really happy to have this moment. And after um, actually to, to feel this moment, I'm really, really um, emotional, actually. I'm really happy for this. And... And I was talking, uh, thinking about how to, uh, or if it, it's possible for a museum to invoke uh, with uh, that idea of common justice, people that can no longer wait, or, or people that have an idea of ecology, uh, that how to krenak as a, a thinker about, uh, in, in Brazil, that he said something that uh, the mountain and the rivers are, are our, our ancestors. So how to invoke that possibility to, to habitat, to habitat, I don't know how to say that. To inhabit. Yeah, uh, in a museum, because I don't know, but um, sometimes I think 
uh, it's really hard to to put somebody's um, and knowledge and thinking in a museum that uh, the way we can really have um, a justice, mm. you know. So I don't know how to to think uh, <laughs> about that. Actually, yes. Thank you. Uh, let's go. Can you pass it? Yes. And then, if you want to still do it, the question, and then we have somebody at the back. Oh. I say for proximity, we're gonna get all okay. of them together, and then Achille is gonna do what he does. <laughs> okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much. Just uh, I, I think as Thais, I'm very emotional too. I I've been following your work for so many times, and uh, so many times I'm long. I'm a Brazilian artist, and the first things that I, that I would like to thank you is because uh, on the past few years, um, a lot of thinkers, artists, and other professionals um, were talking about the end of the world, and that, that idea was not even close to a real thing for me. But today, like when I when I heard you talking about the Earth, I was like, okay, right now I can I can like it, the idea of the end of the world. Mm -hmm. and the continuum of the earth mm -hmm. as something that are not connected really and dependent on us humans. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that it's a kind of a comment. Uh, we, 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 were, we were talking there and then I, um, I was thinking about Denise Ferreira da Silva. Mm -hmm. That's a thinker and she, she talks about uh, a concept that I really like to think that is corpus infinitum. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you if you know it, but mm -hmm. it's something that we can think about a world that we see as a particle thing, uh, as we and you and the light and the spirits and all things that we can touch and then cannot touch are, are connected because we are actually all one. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Just a, a comment about me reminding of the news works mm -hmm. because I yeah. think that could, I don't know. Just to say that Denise is going to be part of the pay. Yeah, He's I know. going to do a show with us uh, <laughs> that star somewhere in April. I, I should know, but I don't remember at the moment. Uh, and we can get the mic if you want. And so I, while I say, so th we're going to have Denise uh, Ferreira da Silva and Arjuna Newman presenting precisely three of the works that they had done around notions of corpus infinitus and many other, no, black as a methods and, and many other things that, that Denise uh, defends. Uh, but we have another question. We will let's get on get on our website. Everything's there. Please. Hello, um, Ashil. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. It was full of life, and this is always something to be thanked for. I, my name is Patricia Soleil. I just wanted to mention two things to you all. Uh, there are rather two questions. One of them, I was a bit surprised when you mentioned the idea of Hewlett as being a pre-Socratic notion about matter as being inert, because as far as, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it, it is before this uh, Socratic difference between um, potency and act and subject object. And um, I actually came across the quest, this, this um, notion in the work of Judith Butler when she tries to find a way in which to capture the interaction, to break down the dichotomy sex-gender and to capture this interaction of matter as something lively. Uh, the second, uh, yes, also to reminded me of uh, questions about what was the world like also in Europe pre-enlightenment, no? when the world was enchanted and there was this disenchantment of the world that Max Weber described, thanks to uh, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. The second question, it, it was just uh, mentioning something, uh, you, something that you, um, some of the way in which you described this most efficient way of being human, open to the unexpected, mm -hmm. uh, reminded me of a very interesting and also very beautiful talk that was given in the Ethnological Museum of Barcelona not long ago, about two months or something, but two amazing ladies, one of them called Maria Cordeiro Souza and the other one called Maria Leuza. They were both, they are both Brazilian. Maria Leuza is a leader from the Munduruku ethnic group 
in the uh, Amazonia, one of the Amazonian territories. And um, she's, she's, of course, fighting against um, illegal mi um, m mining. Uh, Maria Cordeiro was telling us about a concept they, they have called se ingerar. And it reminded me about what you were mentioning. So uh, she's actually doing her uh, master course in Autonomy University. And uh, uh, she's kind of comparing this Native American epistemology, Munduruku epistemology, with a series of um, classic European thinkers, philosophers, all dead white men, so to say. So thank you very much. That was my, uh, my two questions. There you go. Oh, okay. It's all here. <laughs> I was just taken up by all the questions. And <laughs> I was expecting more <laughs> and the comments and uh, and the level, various levels of information. Uh, for instance, about this work being done precisely on. On, on on Amazonian epistemologies, which which, as we know, has been going on for for quite some time now, and and keeps yielding uh, real treasures, in, in terms of uh, uh, some of what you were talking about. And um, and the ways in which um, some of that earlier work. <clears throat> Philippe de Colla, um, the work on perspectivism, and many other uh, inflections, the ways in which all of that is now um, revisited through, through feminist lenses in, in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the one hand, but also through actual indigenous uh, voices, most of which are not necessarily part of the, the anthropological canon or even the philosophical one, but, but part of which is, is to be found uh, in, in actual living, uh, especially artistic practices and, and practices having to do with, with, with medicine. So, so it seems to me that there is a, a new <clears throat> voyage uh, that is uh, uh, opening up there, uh, which we a new landscape of, of thinking and of inquiry, um, which which we have to pay close attention to, if indeed we we, we want to um, to reflect seriously on on this idea of, uh, of our common earth. The um, second point, I mean, uh, I'm just, uh, not, it's not a response to, to your, your comments, but it's a way of thinking with you. There's something that is very striking, which is that the, um, now that uh, uh, Max caught me on the question of the last, I, I, I am now tempted to not use it, but let's just do it, <laughs> do it here, and then we, we'll, we'll close that chapter. The, uh, the, um, it seems to me, but this is an intuition, that maybe the last two reservoirs of, of wisdom in the context of uh, the crisis, ecological crisis we, we are facing, the last two reservoirs are the Amazon on the one hand and, and the Congo Basin on the other. I mentioned these two to notice the extent to which we haven't really brought these two eco-regions or cognitive regions, if you want, 
to, to enter into a meaningful conversation. And, and yet, sorry, Max, one of the urgencies <laughs> in terms of the remodeling of our intellectual landscapes under current CECOM census is to bring these two ecoregions to talk to each other. After all, they are the last two lungs of, of the world, of the planet. But when we say lungs, we are not only thinking about breathing, or we are thinking about breathing in its uh, multifarious senses, including the kind of breathing that the consideration of all the archives of the world might allow. Mm -hmm. Especially at a time when, first of all, we have relied on one kind of archive for too long. Second, that archive, I'm sorry, is exhausted. Mm -hmm. It is objectively exhausted. And therefore, we need to, that's the question you were asking, we need to draw on les archives du tout monde, mm -hmm. on the archives of the all world, which is a concept put forward not so long ago by Edouard Glissant. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there too, there is work to be done by a variety of institutions, mm. including the museum. Mm. That part of the decolonization process of institutions and of knowledge is precisely to open up spaces where all these knowledges, these treasures can be put in dialogue and conversation, including with what you are referring to, because even in the so-called Western archive, I mean, there's something interesting in the Western archive, <laughs> that it is plural. It has a do dominant trends, but it's fundamentally plural. And part of what I personally find extremely exciting in, in interacting with it is that maybe more than any other uh, world archive it has developed a critique of itself which is extremely powerful in fact if you want to critique the western archive there are no better resources than those you find in, in it in order to put it in contradiction with, it, with itself. So decolonization in that sense is not about amputation, is not about um, turning one's back to, I don't want to read the old white men as a lot of students I mean, tell, tell those of us who teach. It's not about that. If you don't want to read old white men, how will you account for Fanon, for instance, since he was in conversation with them? And it is through that conversation that he produced something that contradicts them, but also carries something of them in an attempt at dépassement. Mm -hmm. So decolonization is about dépassement in that sense. So look, those are three re rejoinders to uh, what you said, an attempt at answering your question. Now you're asking why is it that we don't do this? I mean, there are many, many different reasons. But what is important is let's do it. I'm at a point where <laughs> in my life where I think we have criticized enough. <laughs> now we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. We just have to do an experiment. We can't go on, as Kader was telling me, talking and talking and talking. <laughs> we have to do now. And museums are a huge laboratory precisely for those kinds of experimentations 
that are maybe not possible elsewhere. Mm. So that's what we have to do. That's the new program, not of disorder as Francois says, but she will explain, she's coming tomorrow, she'll tell us what she means by disorder. But a new program for reconstruction. Mm. And I use reconstruction in the sense W.E.B. Du Bois uh, used it in the aftermath of, of slavery. So, so why don't we, no, 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 how can we? How can we begin to, to experiment with institutions, with, with forms of knowledge, by opening up all the archives of, of the old, old world? The question of life, of course, I mean, you're absolutely right, it can be dealt with in, in abstract. It has to be dealt with in historically situated configurations. When we say the question of life, what strikes me is, is that not so long ago, we were, we, we were interested, obsessed to some extent, mm -hmm. with the conditions of its emergence and the whole evolutionary debate. We were gripped by <clears throat> what made it possible. How did it emerge? How did it evolve? With what, what effects? Under what conditions did it indeed survive? But we seem to witness a, a shift nowadays. And in the context of the ecological crisis, more and more are those who are wondering about how it ends. That to the old question, how does it emerge? We are now obsessed with the question, how does it end? And this is a very difficult question. How is it that life ends? It's difficult because on the one hand, we do not want to, um, do, let's say, fall into catastrophism or apocalypticism. And yet, at the same time, we want to be mindful of the extent to which historically certain forms of life have been deemed dependable. And, and that is precisely, or I think, why concepts such as necropolitics have found such a, a fertile ground for, for, for thinking. And when we think in terms of necropolitics and the politics of, of giving death, as opposed to that of giving life, repairing it, taking care of it, and sharing it, it's precisely because of the historical dimension I think you, you, are, you are referring to. And in that sense, abolitionist practices become extremely fertile. Because of the um, imaginary power, for me, they open up. Mm. Not because, let's put, let's put it positively, because of the uh, horizon of hope, they open up. A horizon of hope that has been a key ingredient of struggles for emancipation, in any case, for, for many people since modern times, especially for those who have been racialized. And you find that dimension of hope, 
the political dimension of hope. Of course, in, in a number of abolitionist practices, the idea that somewhat certain forms of vulnerabilization of putting to death will come to an end. They will come to an end through the actual struggle of those who are subjected to it and who have been subjected to it over a long period of time. So it seems to me that the dimension of hope has to be at the core of any critical thinking about the end. Otherwise, uh, it's apocalypticism, it's nihilism. It doesn't lead to any, anything not least to the apex we we're talking about. So that, that's the way in which, let's say, I would, I would engage with your, your question. Now, the question of the after is also very tricky because there is always an after of an after. It's not as if, okay, things end today, there's nothing after that. The after is always a door to something else. And this will be the case, <clears throat> including if and when life ends on Earth. Because the fact that human life may come to an end doesn't mean that something won't survive after that. Because precisely of the differential of historical time you were referring to, that is a multiplicity of times, geological time, social time, all of that is not necessarily, uh, uh, does not necessarily come together. There's always this juncture between, between them. So we have to problematize the, uh, the question of the end and the after, not as a cataclysmic moment when the sun does no longer shine, which will happen. I mean, the day it becomes really old, but that's in millions of years. Um, so so that's, that's something, it seems to me, we have to pay attention to. There were many other questions, but <laughs> I think that it's, uh, it's probably time to, to thank each other and, and, and Elvira uh, and wait for, for, for the next speakers tomorrow. Yes, thank you, um, thank you so much yes. again. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all of you for being such an engaged audience. Um, nos vemos mañana aquí a las 5. Seguimos el viernes. Para los que no podéis estar aquí mañana, podéis seguir online si queréis. Y, y nada, eh, muchísimas gracias a todas. <laughs>